Hi, I'm Larry Hardesty, the editor of the Amazon Science Blog. With us today are two Amazon scholars, Michael Jordan and Michael Kearns, and Amazon distinguished scientist Bernhard Schulkopf. The Amazon Scholars Program provides a way for academics to work on large-scale technical challenges at Amazon while continuing to teach and conduct research at their universities. Professor Jordan is the Pei Hong Chen Distinguished Professor of Computer Science at Berkeley. Professor Kearns is a Professor of Computer, Scientist, uh, Computer Science at the University of Pennsylvania. And Professor Schulkopf directs the Empirical Inference Program at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen. As most viewers will know, NeurIPS, the annual conference on neural information processing systems, is the highest profile conference in the field of machine learning. In 2010, NeurIPS introduced a named lecture series, the Posner Lecture, and in its first year, with the entire universe of machine learning researchers to choose from, the committee invited Michael I. Jordan, who is to his field what the other Michael Jordans are to theirs, to give the lecture, uh, and Josh Tenenbaum from MIT. At first, there were two lectures each year. Uh, in 2011, with the entire universe of machine learning researchers to choose from, except Michael I. Jordan and Josh Tenenbaum, they invited Bernhard Schulkopf. And Michael Kearns had to wait all the way until the fifth year for his turn at the podium. So with this year's NeurIPS conference just on the horizon, it is a great honor to be speaking with three researchers whom the conference has recognized as at the absolute forefront of their field. So just to get the ball rolling, I wanted to ask, uh, in the past decade, machine learning has become its own industry. Uh, what has that meant for tech, for AI research, and for the relationship between the two? Maybe Professor Jordan, you can start. Uh, yeah, actually, I'd like to take a moment to give a little bit of history of, of, uh, of deep learning, really back propagation. Um, I watched David Rummelhart, who was my advisor uh, in the early 18, uh, 1980s, uh, struggle with trying to get neural nets to be trained. Um, in those days, it had to be very neural, and the Heb rule was kind of the everything you're, only thing you were allowed to do. Um, and Dave was interested in layered systems and uh, and realized at some point he needed a gradient and uh, figured out he could do a gradient by going backwards and uh, really spent about a year kind of with little diagrams and arrows and all that. And he, he realized he wasn't being neural at that point, but uh, he said, well, what the heck? And uh, and gradients turn out to be these magical kind of things. They, they just allow you to move around in, in high dimensional spaces and, and all. I think Dave intuited a lot of that and was extremely excited when he started to, to uh, get it to work. And uh, he got out the Minsky and Papert book um, and started doing all these old pattern recognition tasks, and for you know, including exclusive OR. The fact that he could do that with a neural network was a, was a big discovery, and he was extremely excited. Uh, Dave sadly uh, died young, and um, uh, he would be reaping the benefits and sort of all the accolades. I think at this point, I just wanted to bring his name up. Uh, I also want to say that I think Dave had a broad vision of what he was doing. Uh, he didn't think that pattern recognition was the end all. Uh, he didn't think that finding maps between one space and another with supervised labels was the end all. Um, and uh, I think he'd be a little alarmed to see uh, the, the, this, the, the takeover of that perspective, that it's enough, you know, you can solve computer vision, you can solve robotics, and all the classical AI problems must, plus you can solve all kinds of other problems, uh, you know, climate change or, you know, or health care or whatever, just with mappings from one space to another based on lots and lots of labels. Um, and he would not be surprised that all kinds of problems start to arise when you deploy those in the real world. Uh, he had a perspective that included semantics. He was very interested in natural language semantics. He was interested already in causality. Uh, he was certainly interested in actions and decisions and, um, and and the full scope of things. He was a cognitive scientist, so he was interested in understanding mind and brain, and that is one totally valid perspective. Uh, but I also think he had a bit of an engineering mentality and, and liked to build things and so on. And and, uh, and personally, I think that's where things have actually gone. It's become much more of an engineering-oriented field um, at, in industry and elsewhere. Uh, so I'll stop there, but I just want to return to this issue of pattern recognition isn't anything, because I think it's a perspective I want to flesh out. Okay. Yeah, I'll bite, uh, as long as we're <laughs> reminiscing in the rocking chairs here on the porch. Um, you, you know, you mentioned AI and machine learning kind of becoming a self-contained industry in the last decade, which I, I strongly agree with. And, you know, when I started studying machine learning in graduate school, it, at that time, machine learning was, you know, an obscure subfield of the then discredited larger field of artificial intelligence. And so certainly if you told me back then that there would be a day when you know you could pick up the wall street journal and it would use the words machine learning as if everybody knew what it, they were talking about i would have you know wouldn't have believed you 
I think, you know, to me, the most, you know, as, as a researcher, I think the most interesting um, kind of effects of that change is that, you know, now the field is about much more than the science itself or even the engineering. So, you know, large cloud platform AI and ML providers um, don't just have an army of scientists, engineers and developers. They've got their entire separate own legal departments, public policy groups, analyst relation groups um and pr as well and and that's quite interesting and that's fun for me because um you know i find myself talking with people who are in the industry but not in the science and so it leads to first of all very interesting dialogues and it also puts a premium on scientists being able to explain their work clearly in ordinary language without kind of losing the important aspects of it and so that's something I've been enjoying learning to do better um, in recent years. Yeah, so that's very interesting to hear all these things. So, I mean, you also asked about the relationship and what does it mean for tech? And uh, if you think about the big picture, uh, you could say that what we are seeing is, is a kind of industri industrialization of information processing, uh, much like the, the early industrial revolutions were about industrializing energy processing. And uh, uh, initially, I, th I would say this has probably started already around the 1950s with information theory, cybernetics, etc. Uh, early on, the information was provided by humans, and now we can automatically learn it from from data in certain settings. And and this, of course, has major consequences for for all technologies that rely on information. Uh, essentially, machine learning allows all these technologies to scale, and uh, and the scaling then in turn improves these technologies since. It produces additional data, and that's a that's a virtual, virtual cycle. And I think that's what uh, a lot of the what drives a lot of the changes that we're seeing nowadays. Um, Professor Jordan, you've said recently that technology should focus on the complementarity game, not the imitation game. What did you mean by that, and how is that relevant to the IT industry? Uh, yeah, so th that's an article that appeared earlier this week with uh, uh, colleagues Daron Asramoglu and um, and Glenn Vale uh, that uh, appeared in, in Wired. Um, maybe to get there, I mean, complementarity is a word from an economist. So e economists are, uh, you know, interested in uh, trade and complementarity, and uh, we get more, uh, you know, the sum of the parts is more, you know, is more, uh, the whole is more than some of the parts. Um, but just to get there in a couple of stages, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about decision making, um, you know, because, uh, you know, real world decision making that's consequential where there's kind of life and death and, and you know, serious consequences isn't just about threshold, the output of a, of, a neural, of a neural net. And so I like to think of the example of uh, medical diagnosis that, uh, you know, so imagine you go into your doctor in a couple of years and um, the doctor is in possession of the world's biggest neural net that's been trained on all the world's medical data. Just the hospitals have all thrown it in there where you just got everything you can possibly have. Um, and it's really good predictive engine based on the data it has. Um, there are people in the NeurIPS community who sort of say that's everything. If we can predict perfectly, we're done. Um, and I want to argue that's not true. Uh, so imagine that the output of one of those, uh, one of the output units there is, you know, a prediction about uh, uh, heart disease. And if the, if the number is over 0.7 based on the historical data, it means you're likely to have a heart attack and you better do something. Um, and your number might be 0.701. Um, you know, what are you going to do at that point? Are you going to treat that as a real decision in any sense that a decision maker has decided something? The answer is definitely not. First of all, you're going to ask about the error bars on that. And you don't mean just a little Gaussian error bar, you know, or some sampling error bar. You mean the uncertainty. And uncertainty arose for many reasons. Maybe uh, the data was gathered a few years ago, not recently. Maybe the machine has changed. Maybe it was gathered on people different from you. Uh, different conditions and so on. You want to dig into all that and start to, you know, help flesh out how uncertain that number is. And, and it's going to be in the moment kind of thinking. It's not going to be just an error bar attached to an output. Uh, moreover, with your doctor, you're going to start to actually have a little dialogue. Uh, you're going to you're going to say, hey, doctor, I remember that when I was a kid, I had asthma. You know, I hadn't remembered that ever before, but now it becomes relevant in the moment. Or my parents had this kind of background or something. And you're going to start to do counterfactuals. You're going to say, you know, doctor, what if I were to eat differently or exercise differently or do this or that? How would that change things? And a good doctor in that moment would kind of add that as data to the uh, to the to the prediction system, and even train it up a little further. And you know, and you know, do what if questions, do A/B tests in the moment. 
And uh, you, then when you start to develop trust with the doctor, you start to have a full, fuller dialogue. All right. And, and, and all of those issues of errors and consequential stuff and uh, um, and uh, reasoning, really. We're talking about reasoning here at this point. That's what decision making is about. All right. Uh, moreover, it's never just one decision. I'm making a bunch of decisions today, many of them consequential at different time scales. Some of them are lasting over months, period. Some of them are today's, uh, you know, and so on. They all are a complex web of decisions that I'm kind of making. And it's not just threshold and the outputs of my pattern recognition device to do that based on the historical data. It's this mixture of dialogue and reasoning, all that. And then if you think even broader, it's really not just me, it's me in the context of a community. And, and in fact, now it's even a planetary community. My medical care is in fact linked to my Michael Kearns and to Bernard's because if something happens to them and it becomes they become tested on something and it works, then that gets transmitted across the, 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 the medical network. And we're linked by transportation networks and commerce networks and so on and so forth. So all of our decisions are linked to each other. It's not just the threshold of the outputs of a bunch of individual pattern recognition devices. Um, so I could go on, but I hope that kind of gives a little bit of the spirit of um, that um, it really is it's just as much about decision making as is about pattern recognition and decision making is never just based on historical data and trying to you know fit a, a network to that of some kind and make a prediction it's always about using that in a flexible way in that moment and new things become relevant in the moment that weren't actually in the historical data at all um, and that's something that you know is critical to real decision making and then this last one i'll, I'll stop and maybe return to it because i do want to talk about the economic side which is that uh you know if if uh if i make a decision and michael makes a decision and there's scarcity in the real world both of us can't have what we want uh, then that's got to be accounted for um and, and uh in the in the learning system and kind of there needs to be auctions and bids and valuations and and, and, and economic ideas brought to bear um, so, uh, Professor Kearns, that the, the idea that uh, the real world consequences are not just a matter of the output of a neural net, I mean, I think that dovetails with some interest of yours in uh, privacy and uh, uh, the ethics of machine learning. Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> again, kind of just looking back not too, too far in history, right? I mean, there was a period not long ago where machine learning, you know, the field of machine learning basically um was was left alone by the world and it left the world alone so what i mean by that is you know earlier in my career right the, the you know most examples of, of machine learning in the field or in industry were really not about making predictions or decisions about individual people it was more about systems so you might try you know like a very old example is you know, using historical data to build models to try to predict directional movement in the stock market, for example. So this has been going on in, in finance and Wall Street for, for many decades. And, you know, so so in something like that, you know, you're they're trying to predict the the movements or behavior of a system. And it might involve, you know, individual people making trading decisions, but you're not really trying to make predictions at that sort of granular level. And so machine learning was sort of operating not on people, but on systems. Um, and so, you know, we weren't really impinging on individuals and the world kind of didn't care about us either. And now, of course, especially, you know, because of advances in machine learning itself and also just like the rise of availability of individual level data because of the consumer internet, you know, we're in a very, very different place now where we do build models and systems that make consequential predictions and decisions about individual people from their historical data. And, you know, obviously, um, I'm sure everybody in the audience knows that with this has come a lot of ethical concerns and demonstrations of sort of unintended negative social side effects of machine learning, like discriminatory models or, you know, privacy violations or the like. Um, and as you know, I've talked about extensively elsewhere, there's an entire science of addressing these problems that's, you know, still under very early development, but is quite interesting. I, I think, you know, the other places where this intersects the outside world is on things like the regulatory front, right? So I think it's becoming very clear that, you know, whatever one's opinion about it, it is, uh, machine learning is going to face regulatory scrutiny. I mean, it already is. 
And I think that that's a very interesting frontier because, you know, when you look at current regulatory proposals around AI and machine learning, they're, they're well-intentioned and many of them are broadly sensible, but they're, um, you know, to somebody like me, they're sort of vastly underspecified and therefore, you know, in my view, probably unenforceable. Um, and so, you know, one like slightly controversial opinion is that I, I really think algorithmic regulation needs to look much more algorithmic itself, because at the end of the day, we are, you know, we are essentially building artifacts that are out in the world making decisions and will make decisions or predictions on any input you give them. That's the whole point of algorithms and machine learning is that, you know, you don't have to explicitly specify what you're going to do in every single corner case. But the model will do something in every in every corner case. And until we get regulation that kind of, you know, really is more in the language of algorithms itself, I think the gap between, you know, well-intentioned regulations and actual enforceability will remain very, very wide. And um, I'll, I'll admit that I don't know how we'll close that gap. I mean, I think it's both, it's like hard to do even if you had the people on hand to do it. Um, but I think the real problem is is just the number of people with the tra the training needed at that intersection of kind of legal and regulatory expertise and enough technical knowledge about how things work is so small right now that um, you know the, the whole the whole problem is basically understaffed. All right. Uh, another aspect of the uh, real world consequences of uh, you know the outputs of neural networks is that the, there's an assumption that um, the real world looks like the data that the neural network is trained on. And Professor Schulkopf, I think that's kind of a concern of yours, right? Yeah, yeah. So for me, this relates to uh, the mechanism that have generated statistical dependencies in the first place. So it gets closer to physics and to causality because uh, machine learning ultimately is based on statistical dependencies. And uh, we usually don't ask where they actually come from, but uh, ultimately statistical dependencies come from a couple of time evolutions in physical systems. And uh, maybe that's too extreme. We don't want to start modeling everything uh, in terms of couple differential equations, but then there's this intermediate level. And uh, one of the first people to, to understand that was the, the philosopher Hans Reichenbach, uh, who wrote this book called the, the, the Direction of Time. And he postulated that uh, every statistical dependence has a causal explanation. Uh, so if two quantities are statistically dependent, it means either one of them causes the other one, or there's, there's something else that has caused both of them. And uh, so, so in that sense, causality is a, a concept that uh, uh, describes the dependencies in a system on a more fundamental level that produces statistical dependencies on, on, on the surface. But, uh, and, and oftentimes it's enough if we work at that surface and just uh, learn from these dependencies. Uh, but basically it turns out that uh, it's only enough as long as we're in this setting where nothing changes. Once things start changing, it's actually helpful to think about the causality and uh, so this is, uh, I mean, I, I got interested in causality 10 or 15 years ago uh, when there wasn't much interest in the machine learning community for that. Uh, initially, I also didn't connect it much to machine learning. I just thought it's a, it's a very interesting problem. But at some point, uh, we started noticing that it is connected. So for instance, if you have, uh, there's this old example uh, from the neural network uh, literature. It's probably, it's probably just an urban myth that someone was training a, a neural network to recognize uh, tanks and distinguish, I don't know, Russian from American tanks. And they noticed it worked with 100% accuracy. And then when they tried to deploy it, it didn't work anymore. And, uh, and of course, the, the reason was something like uh, the American tanks were, were all photographed on a sunny day and the Russian tanks on a cloudy day. So the neural network was just looking at the color of the background. So something like this. And these kind of examples, uh, they're amusing, but uh, uh, funnily, we, are, we haven't made all that much progress. These things still happen. If we just blindly train our neural networks, because uh, in practice, we usually can't guarantee that nothing has changed, then we, we often fall for these kind of pitfalls and then we have to start thinking, uh, uh, modeling more explicitly these issues such as data shift, data set shift, etc. And this is related to causality and to understanding the mechanisms that generate the dependencies. And uh, so that's leads in this direction of, of causal learning. Right, right. Can, can I can I jump in a little bit there? Um, please, just please. to kind of help 
tie together the last uh, you know, sequence of comments. Um, I think Bernard would probably willing to agree that it's not just physical causes, it's, it's social as well. Um, you know, depending on how you want to define social, um, you know, it, um, and and so um, you know, one of the feedback loops that's definitely uh, appears when you start to really work in the real world and collect data and all that is that people care about the outcome, and so you get into what economists call Goodhart's law, which is that if you start to measure something and people are aware it's being measured, uh, and they want to optimize that thing, they will change their data so as to arrive at a better out outcome. So you know, if you're doing credit scoring and people are aware you're using a certain model, they'll learn about how the model works and they'll shift their data to get a better outcome. Um, and that just doesn't happen a little bit. That happens all the time. And so, you know, there is a dependency now, um, and the dependency is coming because there's a social agent who's self self interested and and is is eager to change that that outcome. Um, and you you can't just sort of say wish that away. That that's really part of it. And so, an economist will say, well, that's a game. There's a game theoretic situation going on here. Uh, and there must be costs and benefits, and there must be an equilibrium. Um, so, it, you know, what we want to measure then is, is some, things, some things that are stable about the world. Um, if we don't measure unstable things that people could just change their vector arbitrarily, then there's, uh, the game is not very interesting. Uh, but if we measure things that are stable about the world, it makes it kind of hard to change. So I can't change my height very easily. Maybe I could work really hard. Or I could maybe change my health a little bit, but I have to work hard at it. And um, so I'd, I'd put those costs and benefits into the, to the vector if those become important. Uh, but now I will, I will do that. And I will move my X vector a little bit at least. Um, and now you as the uh, central modeler should be aware of that. And you should be aware that the data has probably been moved a little bit uh, and the model should take that into account. And there should be something. So this is a game theoretic issue. This is a, so these are called Stackelberg equilibria. Um, and there's a whole you know, huge literature on these, um, but these are new kinds of equilibria. First, they're in high dimensional spaces. Uh, secondly, they're based on data analysis. They're not based on just writing down a game and analyzing its dynamics. Um, and there's a causal story. Uh, and of course, there's a fairness story because really it's all about, do, do I get an outcome that's fair to everybody? Um, given that everybody wants a certain outcome, you know, what, what is the right way to think about it? Um, you know, so um, let me again stop there, but just to say that uh, the, to me, at least, it helps very, very much to put the economics together with the social together with the causal and all of that and the, the decision making around it. If you start to think at that level, you put the pieces all together and you start to think about how would I design a system that actually does effectively work, that doesn't fall into these stupid little traps, um, that actually reflects people's social welfare and actually is scalable and is going to work in the long time. Um, and then just the broader, you know, question about what am I designing here? I'm, I'm really designing as some kind of a market. Uh, I'm not designing just a machine learning system, a box, all right? I'm designing some kind of a market where there are valuations and there's long-term behavior um, and markets have their troubles and all that, but, but the dynamics of markets are such that they can often persist for decades or even centuries fairly effectively, adapting to conditions, adapting to situations, having a robustness and all that. And until we start to bring that style of thinking into our systems view of neural networks, our systems are not going to be robust. They're not going to work over long time scales. In fact, our networks don't work over like a day. To, to think of a network that'll work over months or years, it's just, it's just completely. And so we need to start to bring in that style of thinking of equilibria and not just optima and social agents and collecting data. And, and when you do that, I mean, causal is definitely part of it because it is the stable underlying thing you're trying to get at to make any of this possible. Yeah, I mean, on the, on the topic of connections between sort of econ game theory and fairness, which is an interesting topic, um, you know, one framework that's emerged in recent years for essentially enforcing fairness constraints in the training of a model is very explicitly game theoretic, in which you basically, you know, design your algorithm in a way that sets it up as a, a two player game where one of the player is sort of a learner of the traditional variety who generally is just concerned with predictive accuracy. And the other player you can think of as a regulator who is there to enforce the fairness constraints. And there's technical work on this that exactly kind of captures what Mike said about kind of the sort of solution to this constrained optimization problem being the formal equilibrium of a game. One, one thing that's interesting about that approach, though, is you could even imagine um, kind of ripping the regulator out of the code itself and actually having it be a literal regulator. So the, these kind of same framework for algorithm design could be thought of as a crude model for what might actually be the real world back and forth between, let's say, a tech regulator whose goal is to enforce kind of anti-discrimination laws in predictive models and the regulatees. Um, I, I wanted to just come back to something that Bernard said about causality. I, I have a 
complicated relationship with causality, and uh, I've, I've never really done any serious work in it. It's a fascinating topic. I admire people who work in it because it's extremely hard. What's the uh, cause of that, Michael? What's the cause of your you, you lack too. of well, you connection to causality? Just too much other stuff to do. But but I mean, I'm not you know, never say never. Um, just have never kind of found the right set of problems to think about. But but one the comment that Bernard made about this example of you know the tanks and sunny days versus cloudy days. Um, you know, an even more interesting version of that to me is the possibility that we might build predictive models that are extremely accurate let's say, matching human accuracy um, on some cognitive tasks that, you know, we're good at. Um, and it might not be that, you know, in, in that tank example, right, you know, like something bad has happened, right? The, the model has learned the wrong thing. It didn't really solve the problem that we intended. But it could be that, you know, we're building predictive models, especially in the era of deep learning, that basically are extremely accurate, not for sort of spurious reasons, but, but they they just do it in a way they found a different solution to the problem than we we have right there's there's in in particular right like you know the famous example is aviation right so for i don't know i'm you know know little about the history but for some long prefix of artificial aviation people would look at birds and think like okay well we should design flying machines that actually have you know flapping wings and then at some point you know it's figured out no there's an actually completely different way of flying than the way you know nature does it, and um, you know I think this kind of um, this kind of thing is relevant to discussions around things like explainability in machine learning right now, where you know there's a sense in which I worry that in the explainability literature we're we're anthropomorphizing and sort of expecting explanations from let's say a deep neural network that um, kind of are projected onto the same way we solve a problem. So the example would be, you know, like the, the all important problem of detecting cats in images, right? It, it, it could be that we've built a neural network that's fantastic at predicting cats and images, but it's just done, doing it in a completely different way than, than we do it. You know, maybe there's some reflective property of cat's fur that we can't even detect, but, um, you know, is an important feature for the neural network. And so if you, if you, take something like that and then you say like, okay, I want an explanation out of it that matches our intuitions about what makes a cat image a cat, like, you know, a couple of pointy ears around an oval with, you know, a little pink triangle in the middle and a little grid of whiskers. It's just going to be total failure. And so I do think that in areas like, you know, fairness and explainability, kind of causal you know, causal mechanisms might be important there, right? Especially so, so Michael, what if there might be surely, different ways of solving the problem? Surely there are problems that are like if if you deny me it alone at the bank, and I demand an explanation, um, you're going to have to give me one, right? And and uh, the government's probably going to make you give me one. And if you use the neural net inside the box, you're going to have to do something about that. Well, here's a simple answer that I like to think about, which is just that in parallel to your neural net, I'll also build a a, um, a nearest neighbor machine um, and take 50 nearest neighbors. Um, uh, and it's the, the you know it probably it you know nearest neighbors is just going to smooth the surface locally around the query point just like a neural net. I, I, I bet we could do in terms of predictive accuracy we could have a parallel system that's just about as accurate. And why do people not use nearest neighbor because it's extremely slow at lookup time, right? And it's very hard to you know can't be a, you know a, com a fast commodity. Um, but if your uh, regulator is coming in and saying, well, here's what the person is asking, they didn't get a loan. And they want to know why, and you show them 50 people that are in the, uh, you know, the neighborhood, maybe defined by the contours of the neural net. Uh, here's 50 people, and here's their label. Some of them got the loan, some of them didn't. And you look at those 50 people and say, oh, I see, that person got it because they did this differently than me, and all that. Um, that that's not trying to solve necessarily a technical problem. It's trying to solve the user interface to, to humans. And humans are very much case-based reasoners. We like to think about this, and so part of our reasoning would be coming in as causal. But I, you know, trying to to solve the hard, hard problem of looking in a neural network box and then thinking about you know finding its causes and then turning the order to people that seems hard to me. But whereas showing them a few examples seems um, seems more practical. I think, for, I think for humans, explanations are often expected to be causal. 
Uh, and I think one can speculate why this is the case. I think one of the reasons might be that those are those tend to be the more robust explanations, and this relates also to how humans learn because we don't just learn from input output examples. There's a lot of uh, cultural learning going on. We learn from things that people have learned previously and where we have developed efficient means of passing on that knowledge that doesn't involve input output examples. So I think for us, explanations are often causal, but but then there are some other cases, like if you think of a self-driving car or a car driven by an intelligent system, and that system could be a human or could be a machine. And uh, and maybe we, we want to be able to scrutinize uh, this system if something goes wrong, if there's an accident. Now, I think this uh, the level of explanation that we expect of such a system will necessarily scale with the complexity of the task and the complexity of the system. So if a, if a truck driver makes an accident or, or causes an accident, we, we're not going to start analyzing the neurons in the brain, but we might ask whether the driver was uh, writing a text message on the cell phone or whether they were drunk. Or, so that we have certain modes of, of interrogating such a system and, and explaining it to some extent. And then I think once we've exhausted those modes, then maybe we are we are happy afterwards. And eventually, I think for complex technical systems that solve similarly complex problems, uh, we might have to make do with uh, equally sort of somewhat limited modes of, of uh, explanation also. Yeah, I mean, not to uh, beat up on the field of explainability too much because it's very early days. I mean, the theoretician in me, which is not a small part, um, basically feels like the, the real problem there is we don't have any good definitions. So if you look at, you know, if you look at the fairness literature, the, the problem there is we have too many definitions, but, you know, for the most part, many of them are sensible. Um, you know, if you if you ask, you know, like, in many ways, like, in explainability and interpretability, what we have right now are simply proposals of things to try, right? You know, you 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 could do something like what Mike said, and maybe people would find that a satisfying explanation. You have other things, you know, that essentially try to measure the influence each particular input has over the output. But but nobody can answer the question like, well, for what definition of explainability is that the right answer? Is that a good algorithm? Right. So it's just like that that part of it's a black hole. And you know, being someone who believes that at least good foundational research has to start with good definitions that that seems to me something that's badly missing right now um and i've spent you know like enough time thinking about it to realize that it's hard my, my good friend and colleague aaron roth has made the quip that you know it's a bad sign for a field when the best research going on in it is debunking the current proposals um and and there's a sense in which that that's somewhat the state of, of explainability research. Certainly, um, though, there are going to be problems also, just to turn the flip the coin back the other way, there are problems where you don't need an explanation, right? Um, I mean, uh, if I ask Michael how you do the high jump, and you're really good at the high jump, you know, you're not going to be able to explain it to me in terms of the muscles that you use and all that. I mean, maybe with great effort. Um, and and maybe you'll have discovered the Fosbury flop and you'll have done it a completely different way and so on. So, um, you, you know, know, the writer, there, yeah, uh, they, you know, there, there's definitely aspects of mappings from input to output, which is there's no way that any of us could explain. And more of those will happen in real life uh, as these things, uh, yeah, they t absolutely are rolling out. But I think the legal professions, as you alluded to earlier, Michael, is going to have to come in um, and in domains where it actually is consequential and uh, you know, think about the entire, you know, loan process and, you know, just like conference reviewing process needs a lot of thought, right? There's kind of a fairness issues coming in, there's explaining issues and all that. And it's where people are starting to interact with decisions with automatics that we're, yeah, we're definitely lagging and, and definitely it's going to be a few decades, but it's not going to be just a technical solution. It's obviously a, yeah. a part of the social and legal texture of our times. Agreed. Okay, we've all raised a bunch of pretty fascinating issues and difficult problems. And I guess I just wanted to ask you kind of what, what path forward do you see from here? I, I want to return to a couple of things that uh, just only got hinted at a little bit. Um, you know, one of them, uh, I'm writing a long op-ed uh, with uh, some of these social science colleagues that I mentioned earlier. Um, and one of the things that we do kind of uh, want to raise is the issue of autonomy. 
Um, so the, there's two buzzwords of our time, which have you know really caught people's attention. One is intelligence that we're somehow discovering what intelligence is, and, and I personally don't think that's what we're doing. We don't have you know we have even less definitions of intelligence than we have of explainability. Um, we are trying to develop intelligent systems, whatever that means, and I don't think it's like replacing a, a human with a computer. It's it's building systems that behave in predictable, useful, so on and so forth ways. Um, the other buzzword, which I, I have even more trouble with, is autonomy. Uh, it's viewed as a desirable feature that I got an autonomous system. And we often say autonomous self-driving cars. And there's whole little kind of work workshops on autonomy. Um, and, and I think we need to question a little bit about why autonomy. Um, you know, and so I because I think part of the problem is that it goes back to the old AI uh, dream, which is that I'm going to, you know, have my Turing machine who can't communicate with anybody and it's going to, you know, answer the Turing questions. Or I'm going to have my robot that I'm going to push out on the stage and it's going to dance and sing and, and talk in natural language. And I'm not, uh, there's no cord attached to it, right? So it's a show off kind of thing that I can make my systems autonomous. Uh, and it's a show off, it's a thing that you know, implies that I've somehow discovered, like, you know, Frankenstein, this the secret elixir of of life and intelligence that I can, uh, you know, the, so I stand back and, and look at my proud creation. Um, now, 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 most systems that I want to build, I don't want autonomy. So self-driving cars, I do not want autonomous self-driving cars, just like I don't want autonomous self-flying planes. I want them federated and talking to each other and uh, sending high-level information back and forth and making plans together and having a network that's all federated up and have uh, interfaces and, and engineering thought given to building that entire system. And in fact, it's not just a car. It's a whole transportation system that gets people and packages around the world. It should be thought of at that level. If it's not, it's just not the right. So really, we're building like a like a you know a, a system that brings food into a city. We're bringing the entire system. We're not just you know bringing one piece of bread into the city autonomously, whatever that might mean. Um, you know, moreover, I think that so autonomy is just often just the wrong level of analysis. Um, and, and then often I think it tends to concentrate power in the hands of too few. You know, so the you know the number of people who've developed say you know GPT three or something is a small handful of humanity. Right, um, and uh, and it's sort of being held, you know, closely. And it's and and companies have to, if they're going to show that they've done it autonomously, they can't have thousands of people working on it. That that meant too much human intelligence went into it. We didn't solve an AI problem. A small team means we solved an AI problem. So Wikipedia is not an AI, you know, entity, right? Even though it's super intelligent, it's more intelligent than any other AI artifact I can think of. Uh, but it's not an AI artifact because all these humans put all this effort into it, right? Um, it's not an autonomous system, Wikipedia. Um, but it's the most effective thing we have, right, in, in terms of the semantics uh, on the computer. Um, you know, so uh, uh, autonomy then tends to concentrate power in the hands of the, of the few. And, and we are some of the elite here, uh, you know, but we really have to recognize that that's a problem. That we don't want to have these these artifacts, this technical power, concentrated in the hands of a few, locked away, and then you know they didn't they did it for good reasons. They were trying to help humanity, but nonetheless they got a huge power leverage that that, that other people don't have. Um, and it's really it's not because they have super knowledge or anything. They just had the you know the the data and the time and the wherewithal to to do all that. And, and you can pull away from that if you can say the goal is not to develop these autonomous AI type things. The goal is to federate. The goal is to develop complementary systems that interact with each other, interact well with humans. Uh, trade is possible, et cetera. Open it all up and let things flow, and then design the level of systems. And systems should be planetary scale. Uh, you know, it shouldn't be just your little company and your little, uh, you know, HCI kind of interface to a human being. It should be the entire federated system. Um, so, again, I'll, let me stop there to, to just, I wanted to kind of open this up. You know, to me, part of the way forward here as a technical minded person is to indeed bring in e economics and social science concepts. They're sort of sitting there ready to be brought together with statistical machine learning. Weirdly, most economics work doesn't have a lot of statistics in it. There's econometrics where you measure the economy, but the mechanism design and the thinking about uh, agents and all that is you assume the preferences or distributions are known. Uh, well, we don't assume those kind of things. So it's just a natural marriage and we can start to think at the systems level. Um, so anyway, I really, intelligence, AI, I've kind of, uh, you know, in a lot of my writings, I've kind of, you know, uh, hankered for a different terminology. I think it's sad that we're going back to the 50s term, you know, vision, which we don't have the same vision. Um, but anyway, I've kind of relented on that. But autonomy, I just really want to question more deeply. I think it's it's it's, it's really misleading. Uh, it's misleading us as researchers into goals that we actually don't really aspire to. 
I mean, I, I would tend to think also in humans, you don't want full autonomy. If a human drives a car, you also want them to sort of interact with other cars and not just uh, go full power through every crossing. So there's always going to be some limitations to personal autonomy if you want the overall system to work. So I think I I share your view. And uh, if, I, if I now come, uh, maybe give a slightly different answer to the to the question about where to go or where where we see sort of promising paths in the future. So I, I, I think I share your overall vision, Mike. I think this is uh, the right way to think of the broad picture. At the same time, I think it's it's very complex. Uh, if you have the complexity of, of economics, multiplayer games, causality, etc., you put it all together, uh, you have to break it apart somehow. And for me personally, the uh, next step or next thing that I want to understand is probably something simpler. Uh, but already pretty hard, I find. Uh, for me, that's the field of, of causal representation learning. And uh, by that, I mean, so if we go back to so classical AI at the beginning, uh, we were people were assuming that the symbols are given. Think of a chess program. We know what are the chess pieces, what are the possible moves. Uh, and people were assuming that also the programs, how to generate intelligence based on these, by processing these symbols are provided by humans. So both is provided and let's see how far we get. Uh, that didn't take us very far. Then uh, machine learning came around. Um, so with machine learning, so that the advance in machine learning was not just that the rules are learned, but also at least uh, with, with most of modern machine learning, that also that the representations and the symbols are automatically learned. Now, if we, as I've argued before, if we have to move towards, uh, when to move towards causal learning and, and not just everything based on statistical dependencies only, then uh, if we look at most methods in causality, in, in a certain sense, we're going back to the symbolic stage because they are usually pretty low dimensional and we have, someone gives us the symbols and now we want to learn what are the causal relationships and how do we correct for our confounding, et cetera. So in a way, we've uh, even if we can combine it with machine learning, uh, it looks like we've taken a step back. So I think what we need in that direction is uh, we have to develop this field of, of causal representation learning. So we want to learn both the causal connections, the mechanisms that connect variables, and also what are the variables in the first place? How do you identify the useful variables in high dimensional data? So I think that's uh, going to be interesting because current representation learning is really mostly about just learning statistical representations, which are useful for prediction, but uh, maybe not much more. And uh, ultimately, uh, I like this quotation uh, of, of Konrad Lorenz, the Austrian ethologist. Uh, he once said that thinking is nothing but acting in an imagined space. So if we want to have representations or imagined spaces in which we can also think or act, then uh, these spaces have to contain notions of intervention. So I think these kind of causal representations, they will also go towards uh, what, what I think Mike referred to before, uh, to, towards reasoning, uh, which we will ultimately need uh, if we want to move away from this pure pattern recognition view of intelligence. I get the last word, I guess. <laughs> sure. um, and you know, I've never, <clears throat> I've never been a researcher to have a five or a ten-year plan myself, and have mild suspicion of those who do. So the idea of my, you know, pontificating about the next ten years of our field and industry is is obviously even harder. But I, I, I will tell you that the area that I'm most interested in watching play out because I think, like big big things will have to happen there, and and it will, you know be a strong influence on our field, it, it, it is the regulatory and legal landscape. And I think that, you know, um, this isn't just a matter of, you know, waiting around for the FTC to decide what it's going to do or what it's not going to do. I really think there needs to be some sort of bottom up fundamental reframing of the of sort of technology regulation and how it interacts with technologies like AI and machine learning and also kind of a whole scale change in the way we train scientists, the way we train engineers, the way we train attorneys, regulators and the like. So I think that, that you know, that's going to be a very, very interesting, important area that has to somehow get populated over the next decade. Um, and so that that's the area I think I'm, I want to keep a close eye on. Is that something that stands outside machine learning or is that kind of regulation part of this Huge you know, that's kind of, you know, as per my earlier remarks, I, I don't think it can be. I don't think it can be. Like, I, I, 
I do not think it's a good idea for people who don't have sufficient understanding of the science itself to be regulating it. And I also don't think it's a good idea for, you know, the science to be entirely unregulated, right? We can kind of see that there have been, you know, major side effects of that. Um, and so I, I think this this has to be a partnership somehow. I think it's very far from that right now, but there is sort of seems to be general agreement in the room that something has to change on both sides. And so I think that that's that should be interesting to watch. Okay. So, so I'd like to note that um, historically there have been examples of this, and I'm not sure the word science is actually quite right here because like chemical engineering or electrical engineering, right? When they came on the scene, they were building on science in both cases, you know, chemistry and electrons and so on. Um, but they built systems that work for humans at scale and they had to be regulated. So you would not bring electricity to your home unless the underwriter's laboratory had kind of, you know, signed off and and the whole system was regulated in ways that it wasn't going to damage humans and, and, and so on. So the whole field of chemical engineering was a bringing together of basic scientific concepts with scalability concerns, with regulatory concerns, and a whole new ecosystem developed to make it possible to have chemicals, you know, flying around our world in new ways and new configurations. And similarly with electrical engineering, I personally actually think that's what's happening now. This is information science engineering, whatever you want to call it. There's not a good terminology for it, but it's the engineering of flows of data, flows of values, flows of decisions, interacting with humans and, and computing uh, to build systems that hopefully, you know, entertain us, uh, make our lives safer, make our lives more enriched and so on. And those systems have to be regulated. Uh, if they're not, it's just, there's just, it's, it, we, we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, but it is a large scale engineering system and problem. It's not just the math meets the, the lawyers. It's, it's about the whole engineering style thinking. And, and Michael, I think is totally right about not just bringing all those together, but also a new way of training to have the engineer, the emerging information engineers or whatever you want to call them, to be able to simultaneously think of the regulatory environment that they're building, the systems they're building, and the and the fundamental principles. Okay. Um, I just, I'll just one last comment, which is that, uh, you know, we're not really focusing too much on industry here. Uh, you know, this is an idea thought leader kind of forum. Uh, just to say that this style of thinking I see more in industry than I see in academia. You know, in industry, you solve a problem and you bring in people from all these different points of view and you think through the problem and the consequences a little bit. Because if you build a product that doesn't, you know, that fails in, in one of these dimensions, it's not going to work. And so you do see more of this dialogue there. And uh, I, I think that's another kind of way to go is to get our industry co academic uh, connections to fire up some of these challenges and uh, to help, uh, you know, uh, push each other on both sides. Great. Well, you're all three illustrations of the, the way Amazon is trying to do that, to foster that connection with academia. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. This has been hugely enlightening. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm look forward to see what happens on, on, on all these fronts in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.